There's lots of track on the market, but which one's right for you? Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. With the new Pico Code 75 Bullhead coming on the market, I'm in a bit of a quandary on where to go with the track at Chadwick. The old Chadwick TMD will stay as Code 100, but the new scenic area, I'm kind of having a rethink. The trouble is there's so much uh, choice available. You've got Code 100, Code 75, Code 75 Bullhead, P4, EM, the kind of list goes on and it's all a bit confusing. So what I thought I'd do in this video is try to explain the differences between them and the differences between scale and gauge. I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to this channel and if you click the little bell icon, then you'll get a notification every time one of my videos is released. So a quick look back to the beginning, where did it all come from? Well, in the UK, we kind of invented the railways and the standard gauge was four foot eight and a half inches. And Brunel, sadly, he, uh, he decided on a broad gauge, um, which is obviously wider than, uh, than standard. And eventually he succumbed you know, with the rest of the networks and right across the UK, then it came four foot eight and a half and it's known as standard gauge and it kind of spread pretty much across the world. I think it's, uh, the States and Canada, um, a lot of European countries, etc., use standard gauge. There's a few that don't, but there's always going to be an anomaly. So what's narrow gauge? Narrow gauge is anything smaller than standard and broad gauge is anything wider. That's easy, isn't it? Right, so where do we go from here? Right, this is seven millimetres to the foot, or as we know, this is O gauge. Well, this is O gauge, this is 016.5. So um, in accordance with seven millimetres to the foot, if you measure the distance across here, um, and then obviously times it by seven, with seven millimetres to the foot, you end up with standard gauge of four foot eight and a half. Whereas on here, you don't. This is a narrow gauge piece of track. Right, so how do we get from O gauge to where we are today in the UK? Well, um, a long time ago, I think it was decided that um, people just couldn't afford to buy great big trains to run on great big track, whether it was the room, the finances or whatever. So it was decided upon building trains and train sets for kids and grown-ups on a smaller scale. Scale. So it was rescaled from O, they went to HO, which is half of O gauge. Now, half of O gauge, O being seven millimetres of the foot, HO track must be 3.5 millimetres to the foot, and that's exactly what this is. Um, that's the gauge of this track. But it's not the scale. This is the great bit. Because when they were deciding, when they de deciding the, the size of the locomotives, they'd obviously decided on the track it was going to be HO, and when you, when you build the locos to go on it, they actually couldn't fit the clockwork mechanisms and the, um, the electric motors into um, the, lo the, the size of the locomotives to run on HO track. They almost could. So instead of going for the, for the scale of 1 87th of an inch, they went, went to 1 76th of an inch and double O scale was born, but they ran it on HO track, which is why uh, here in the UK, we have had a scale to gauge mismatch from the beginnings of time. So what's the real differences then on the face of it between HO track and double O track? Well, if you look at them, the main thing that you notice straight away is clearly the sleeper spacing. This EM track is far more prototypical and EM track is 18 millimetres between the rails. Hence the EM stands for the 18 millimetre society. HO track is 16.5 millimetres between the rails. So uh, if you wish to convert to EM track, you would need to convert all your rolling stock. And that is a very, very uh, serious step to take. And there is also the P4 society, which stands for the prototypical four millimeters to the foot, which is the true scale, because actually once it's not 176, they maintain that I think it's 176 point, bear with me, 
176.2. So the EM society, the P4 society, have a very, very tighter tolerance than the EM society. So what does that mean for you? Well, if you want to go down the EM or the P4 uh, route to more prototypical running, um, it's a very expensive step to take. You can convert your sort of rolling stock and your coaches reasonably inexpensively, but your, your, your locomotives and your trains and everything else, now you're talking big bucks and a lot of expertise is required. In this image, you can see the difference between um, the two tracks. And if you notice where the tracks are and the, on the left hand side, you can see the tracks are far more narrow um, and it looks far more prototypical in the right hand image. And you can see that the rails are kind of out towards the buffers. And they're not kind of pushed in and squashed. So there's the dilemma. Now, I must confess, I am never going to go down the, the P4 or the, or the EM um, uh, avenues, it's just far too complicated for me. I have too much stock to convert. If you're running a small exhibition layout, then you know that's the sort of thing you want to do. You want to hand build your track and convert your locos, but you might only have three or four locos on, on, a, on, a, on a small layout. Um, but it is, um, it is the edge of enthusiasm to me. It's just a step too far. I, I really, really couldn't afford to go down that, that, uh, that, that road. So here we are then with the dilemma of running the wrong scale on the right gauge. Or the right gauge on the wrong scale, whichever. Um, talk about track manufacturers, I would always go with um, either Pico or Hornby. They are our kind of bread and butter manufacturers. However, with track, I will always buy uh, Pico track. The only one exception is that Hornby do make a fourth radius curve and when I want to build myself a helix that is an option I would go for. But apart from that my money is spent down in Dorset with, uh, with Pico in beer. That's the kind of um, the place I go to because I want to support British jobs doing kind of uh, producing stuff for the British market. Kind of makes sense to me. Um, and Pico now make three different, we'll call it double O gauge, three different double O gauge um, uh, tracks, which are code 100, code 75 and code 75 bullhead. Hornby also make a code 100. Now, the contentious bit, the difference between a train set and a model railway. It's a kind of perception thing. I might suggest that uh, train sets use set track and model railways use streamline track. If you have any thoughts on this, then please leave a comment below. Please don't use any swear words, I will delete them. Anyway, so um, where do we go and what's the best thing to use? Um, for my layout, um, I use, I've use i used code 100, I haven't used code 75, but I have a yearning towards bullhead. So let's now have a look at the differences between the track and the advantages and the disadvantages of each sort. So Pico track code 100 and code 75, what does the code 75 or the code 100 mean? Well, the 100 on the code 100 refers to the, dimen the vertical dimension of the rail. So if you pop a micrometer on the rail and measure it, then obviously you can then see that you get uh, 0.1 of an inch is the uh, the decimal measurement of the track and with code 75 it's 0 0.075 of an inch again is that dimension and that's the same for bullhead. So are there any benefits to having a, a, a deeper rail? Well yes it is this track is is sorry this track being the code 100 is a nice robust decent track it can take um, abuse is probably the wrong term but it's quite forgiving uh, the way you use it. If you bend it a little too much, it doesn't start popping out of the chairs. Whereas the Code 75 is a finer track and does look a little better. When they're both in and ballasted, it's not that easy to see the difference. But with Code 75, you get electro frog uh, slips, double slips and single slips and uh, long crossings. So there are advantages to using Code 75. I've not made the mistake but I've chosen to use code 100 um, and then when I wanted to run through a double double slip what I then did was convert it to code 75 
did the double slip and then converted back coming out the other way because I had so much code 100 track left from other projects. So it made sort of financial sense to keep with the, the code 100 and just use the code 75 components when I wanted them to. But there is another disadvantage to using code 75 um, besides its um, being a little more fragile and that's the use with rolling stock. I imagine like most modelers some of my stock is quite old and this is the chassis off um, the old 1960s Hornby Freightliner um, and sadly they always tend to bow in the middle as you can see and if you found a way of sorting yours out then please leave a comment because uh, I think I'm going to revert to using brass box section to try and straighten them up. Anyway, these things, I like these, they've got a nice train, you know, a rake of sort of 10 freight liners with all the box cars on. It's great. And the other older train that I've got uses the Lima Siphon type parcels um, wagons. And these are okay, they run all right. Until, of course, you try to run them on code 75. So if I switch for a code 75 piece of track, and as you've seen, it's a little bit finer. The sleeper spacing is exactly the same. So still well out of um, tolerance, let's say, being really HO track. But when I pop this on here, and I imagine you can hear that hopefully through my lapel mic, um, the wheels trundle along on the chairs of the sleepers because of the, uh, the change in the height of the uh, the rail themselves, they now run on the on the chairs. So you need to either bin these things um, or rewheel them. So there's a dilemma. And I quite like these. I think I've probably got half a dozen of these and probably 10 of the Freightliner ones. I will come on to the bullhead in greater detail in a moment. But if I pop this on the on the on Pico's bullhead code 75, it has less of an effect because the chairs, I believe, are smaller, so it rumbling along on them, it kind of becomes less noticeable. So there's the dilemma. What do you do with your old stock? Are you going to be prepared to rewheel all these old wagons? And I think you, they, I think they end up sort of about three quid an axle. Well, that's twelve quid for this, just to rewheel it. And uh, I probably only paid eight or ten quid for it in the first place. So you end up with the dilemma of what to do. And it's another reason perhaps you shouldn't go to Code 75 unless you're prepared to face you know, doing away with a couple of old trains um, or the expense of rewheeling. And then it takes us on to this little beastie here, which is uh, Pico's new bullhead track. And I do like this track. This is a nice, uh, a nice looking piece of work. When you can compare the sleeper spacing, you can clearly see that um, it's shockingly different. But the sleeper spacing is prototypical for the UK, even though the um, the gauge is still um, out, as we've seen, as I've explained earlier. Currently, the Code 75 bullhead range um, is not complete, and um, obviously the track exists, and so does the left and right hand large radius points. The double slips, single slips, and diamond crossings, um, I believe, are in production, and the left and right hand medium radius points are under development so hopefully uh, later this year um, all these items will kind of start to appear because um, it's very difficult to obviously to build a new layout without all the major components. I had thought of starting to pull up track and replace it with bullhead where I can use long radius points uh, rather than medium radius um, I, I could con convert those over. On Chadwick back there in the corner I have some curved points um, and there are no plans currently for curved points in the bullhead but that shouldn't be such an issue for me because those curved points will go underneath um, a small town 
uh, bridge seam that hopefully will be removable. I'm sure I have to maintain those points, but currently I'm not planning to do that. Of course, some people have go for the modern image and um, there is no concrete bullhead track in existence, if that makes sense, because obviously bullhead track was in production um, when supported on wooden sleepers. And then when British Rail went to concrete sleepers, we then went to the flat bottomed rail. So what do you do if you wanted prototypical uh, track with flat bottomed rail with concrete sleepers? Well, that takes us to our next little evolution. So here we are again looking at the bullhead and here is another piece of track and this has the correct sleeper spacing um, as in the bullhead. But what is this? Well, this is actually a piece of code 100 where I've just cut the webbing on the back of the sleepers. So by cutting all these sections off I can then move the sleeper around um, and obviously you lose so many sleepers off the end um, and on this stretch of track which actually measures round about nine and a half inches because in uh, in true to scale that would be a 60 feet 60 foot piece of track which is how long uh, they were connected up um, by fish plates to the next piece of rail and hence you get the da -da 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 noise so if I put it alongside, you can see the sleeper spacing is, is correct, which leaves you another alternative that rather than pay for um, a ton of Pico Code 75 bullhead, you could start hacking in to your old track. To do this piece of track, this sm one small section, took me two and a half minutes just to cut the webbing and then to line up all the speed all the sleepers took me probably another sort of five minutes so to do a layout it would be an absolute nightmare of course if you're making just a small uh, diorama or maybe a small exhibition layout that's kind of you know four foot by two foot then that it that clearly is an option the other thing to think about is if you are a modern day image kind of guy you could actually do this to your concrete track rather than um, uh, you know, having to use the incorrect spacing uh, of the concrete code 75. Um, so I just think it's an interesting option for the concrete sleeper modern image guys um, that you could just simply cut up your track um, and then correctly space it out. Of course, they don't make uh, concrete point work that makes sense concrete sleepered point work but then hopefully you can see on these images here that I, I took uh, in near Chester a couple of weeks ago you've got the two uh, center lines which are concrete sleepered and the two outside lines which have wooden sleepers and the sleeper spaces no matter of interest aren't exactly the same between the wooden and the concrete there is some difference there um, though I'm always led to believe it should be uh, kind of 25 sleepers per 60 foot length of track. But what is quite noticeable in this image is the fact that um, you can hardly tell the difference in the colour of the sleepers compared, sorry, the concrete sleepers compared to the wooden sleepers. So, which puts us in the dilemma of we're there with spraying sleeper grime all over our um, wooden sleeper track to take away the plasticky edge of it. Whereas actually in reality, it, timed, it can't, might just be getting lighter because the colours of the concrete sleepers and the colour of those wooden sleepers are very, very similar. Now, while researching this over the last couple of days, I did come across a few threads um, that referred to the spacing of double O speakers in a kind of a derogatory way um, because of a comparison they'd made. And the comparison they made was actually with um, seven millimeter scale track and this is 016.5 um, as if the reprofiled track uh, looks similar. Now I think it's fair to say that it doesn't look similar. I mean these sleepers are kind of huge as you'd expect from um, an O gauge comparison. 
um, so I don't necessarily agree with those comments but at least there you can see um, how they are. So in summary where do we get to today? Well I've looked at code 75, code 100 and code 75 bullhead and I've hopefully given you my views. I do think I do like the bullhead I think it really is a step forward and once all the rest of the point work comes uh, into, into production full time then it will be um, a really decent track to go for but from a train seti point of view let's say it's not ideal it's not certainly not ideal for uh, for children i would stick with uh, code 75 and as i said before pulling away from the set track which i regard as train sets if you disagree leave a comment i know i'm in for a good thrashing on this one um, and but i've looked at all those tracks and obviously the respacing and the explanation between gauges and scales god this is such a nightmare anyway i do hope you've enjoyed it today please leave a comment if you have and if you'd like to see um, me going to a bit more depth on this because i can do comparisons between um laying the laying the track themselves the use of uh, of points um, and ballasting so we can see the whole the, the finished result of, of, of all three scales if you'd like to see that then please leave that in the comments so there we go in the meantime, I'll see you in two weeks' time, hopefully, uh, on, on a Friday as usual. And I'd like to thank my patrons, and the patrons are there. There's my uh, subscribe button, and there should be a video here and here to keep you busy. So there we go. Until two weeks' time, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.